This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released July 17th, 2017, episode 352, Cunning with Michael Osman. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Michael Osman of Great Scott Gadgets. Welcome back, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing very well, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Well, we always love having you on. We're going to talk a little bit of security and radios and all the usual stuff, I'm sure. But we're going to start <laughs> with something you didn't know. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh, you you have a Hack RF subreddit. That's what we found oh, yeah. out like five minutes I prior to out. this. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's exciting to know. Yeah, <laughs> look look at all of the things you've spawned without even without even I, knowing about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So if anyone's wondering about um, like why I never answer questions on the Hack RF subreddit, it's because I didn't know it existed. <laughs> Which leads to the question: how how do you how do you interact with people for HackRF these days? I mean, is it like is, is there a separate forum or is it direct or what? Well, there's a, a mailing list. Okay. And there's IRC. Ah. Okay. Uh, and that's and that's pretty much it. We actually do probably the majority of our support via IRC. Okay. Uh, which for some people is really super convenient and for other people they're like what's irc um, <laughs> and you're like you're like you damn kids get off my lawn <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> uh so we do have uh, uh like a link uh, a live link to the irc from uh from our website uh-huh. so you can just click a link and have it in a web browser uh so even if you have never used irc before and don't have an irc client oh, installed it's one of the, the web like app that. things uh, yeah, yeah yeah so it's relatively easy for even somebody new to IRC to come chat with us. I have to say, Although, I, I every time I keep trying, I keep trying it. I keep trying to go back to it. I'm just like, oh yeah, my IRC client's been running for four days and I haven't touched it. Oh, mm-hmm. I guess I should do that. So, <laughs> I guess it's just like what you're used to, right? I mean, like that's I don't know. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, we have multiple channels on Freenode. There's a HackRF channel and an UberTooth channel and so forth. And, and um, you know, we started using Freenode some years ago because Freenode makes, uh, makes services available specifically for open source projects. Mm-hmm. And we started using it mostly for internal stuff, you know, development and collaborating with other developers. Uh, but it, it, it kind of ended up being the, the primary way we communicate with users as well. Well, if you're already there, why not, right? I mean, like, if everybody's already in there, it's like, come on in, you know, or, or do you have separate channels for dev versus support? No, it's all one. Oh, it is, yeah. So, well, hopefully it's not it's not so much support traffic that you can't get anything else done either, right? So. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, it really isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just can't, I can't seem to, to keep, keep locked onto it, but I guess there's... There's a thousand things online these days, including Reddit and everything else. So, yes, it's just you gotta go. You gotta go where the people are. I remember uh, I was trying to get a hold of Randall Monroe at one point for like to be a judge of the Supercon or not Supercon of the the uh, the Hackaday um, uh, prize. Oh right, and that's the only way to get a hold of him is is IRC. <laughs> oh no, kidding! <laughs> Didn't know that. Yeah, well, he de- he declined. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> unsurprisingly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but there there is that. Um, he did he did a comic about Slack, I think, and it was about like, oh yeah, like doing like a bot that would tie over between Slack and IRC and stuff like that, and it's how it's people are going to be asking to tie into IRC for the rest of time or something like that. So right, yeah. I really liked the the one he did that was like, um, uh, sort of a, a Venn diagram of all the different ways that he communicates with different groups of people. Yeah. Uh, I I don't remember. Could, could you sorry? Could you keep going with that? I don't remember oh, what it's just saying. like. Uh, you know, there's this group that you communicate with via IRC, and there's this group that you communicate via Slack, and there's this group that you communicate with via SMS, uh-huh. and there's this group that you communicate with. You was, know, was, on was there no crossover Facebook though? Or Twitter or, or whatever, <laughs> and and there's very little crossover. Yeah, yeah right, and, right. But it was it was pretty interesting, like yeah. how how um, the diverse modes of communication that we have these days and. Yeah. And the fact that you end up with relationships with people that are 
that often are exclusive to one mode of communication. Yeah, no, that is crazy because like you think about it, like I, I often think like where the hell are people online talking about certain subjects? And it's not that they don't exist sometimes. It's just that you don't mm-hmm. know where they are, right? I mean, right. for the longest time, I, I was like, where like talking to people about KiCad, right? I mean, it was like where, I mean, there was the Yahoo mailing list and then there was like, but then there was an IRC channel that I, I didn't know about. And and that's where some of the devs hung out, and that's where a bunch of right. the users hung out, and stuff like that. And um, and you know they're they're kind of everywhere. They they are spread out now too. Obviously, it's a little bit more than it used to be. But but yeah, uh, <laughs> if you can't find them, then it's like oh, it feels like a wasteland. But it's it's just that you're you, you're not looking behind the right curtain, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, how speaking of KiCad, how's your how's your KiCad these days? How what's what's going on with that? Oh, it's. Uh... Actually, I haven't been doing a whole lot of electronics design in the last uh, few weeks, but um, I've been doing a little and uh, trying to get some other folks uh, in the lab doing stuff. Oh yeah, you have. Uh, you said you have interns. Yeah, how's yeah, that going? Interns. That's going pretty well. We yeah? decided to hire an intern for the summer, and we ended up hiring three. <laughs> <laughs> They're so cheap. It's a little. <laughs> it was a little crazy, yeah. but. Uh, but it's worked out pretty well there it's a good group of people and um and they're doing some good some some good projects for us uh focusing on software development though not yeah. hardware okay uh we figured it would be hard to you know a to find people like you know mid mid undergrad level yeah uh who could really help us with hardware design uh especially when like the the just getting familiar with the tool chain, like getting familiar with sure, and stuff, right, is, right, is, yeah. it, it takes a, a huge amount of time. And um, and we have so many software projects that we want to do or right. we have half finished. And we thought, you know, we could probably find, uh, we're more likely to find candidates kind of in that experience range who could help us with some software projects. Uh, so that's what we focused on. And we have uh, three software developers for the summer. Nice. Uh, it's been fun. Do they um, do they have RF knowledge? Or are you teaching them that stuff too? No, they don't, and they're learning a little bit, but not too much. Um, the uh, <laughs> they keep using the the hack RF subreddit. Nobody answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that the projects we have them on are, yeah. don't really require them to be using uh, using the tools. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of like over the air stuff, uh, so we have two uh, kind of traditional college age students who are doing um mostly python development for us uh, for a project that uh, dominic and i will be talking about at black hat coming up here nice uh currently and then after black hat they'll be working on something else i'm not sure what yet uh and then we also have uh, a more senior uh intern who came to us sort of out of the blue um uh, who's um a super interesting guy um Mike Nabaresny, uh, he, um, I can point you to his, uh, I, sh- I should put it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has some really interesting uh, resources on the 6502. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like, if you find his 6502.org. Oh, that's uh, his. Oh, cool. His, his website. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, and he has a bunch of other interesting, really interesting projects uh, that he's done. But anyway, he's he's a much more senior software developer. He has a lot of uh, experience, and he uh, but he he went back to school recently to focus on embedded. Oh, nice! And and he contacted us. He was like, "I want to be a suburban intern and just do embedded development for you because I need embedded experience." And we're like. Okay. Yep. If you yep. want to, <laughs> and, and that, folks, is the way you do it. It won't always work, but especially with like small organizations where you can actually get a hold of the people. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. It's like, oh, I'll work for peanuts. Cool. All right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's he's uh, doing a bunch of uh, great fet development. Awesome. Which is really awesome. good. And yeah. so we're trying to we're trying to give him projects that are all uh, focused on embedded C because uh, he's a super experienced python and ruby developer he's probably a better python developer than me or dominic but he uh but he wants to do more embedded Dive so in. we're yeah, him embedded right. projects yep yep that's cool that's great that's great uh how's how's the uh, how's the great fed going i mean pretty well yeah uh we have a lot of software still that we want to do for it but it's uh super close to uh being ready to ship and um 
And can you give we, people a reminder about what that project is if they haven't heard the this? I mean, I we were actually looking at you got you and uh, Dimitri were talking about that last time you were on, which was we went and looked and it was October of 2016. But uh, right, yeah, yeah, that was the last time I was on. Uh, it's a sort of general purpose hardware hacking tool, USB connected. Uh, the the main idea is that it gives you a very large number of pins that you can control over USB. And architecturally, it's basically just a big microcontroller that's USB connected, and then it breaks out everything, all the, all the different peripherals and everything out of that microcontroller. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we we kind of envision it being used for things that are similar to the good fet of Travis Goodspeed or similar to the bus pirate that a lot of people know. Yeah. Um, and it has an expansion interface, so we envision having a lot of different expansion boards, kind of similar to Arduino Shields, except the, the development model is that instead of doing embedded development, you're doing, uh, like, you're interacting with it in a yeah. Python environment. Right, your hard, hard, hardware API, right? It's a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It cool. also has a secondary USB port, so you can use it for... Uh, uh, some fun USB things like um, probing, uh, probing another USB host, and yeah. stuff like that. See, now this is—I mean—and this seems like it's almost uh, thematic for for great scat gadgets. Gadgets, rather, it's a—it's uh, like you guys are giving software interfaces to the real world, right? So it's either RF or, no, in this case, just physical uh, interfaces for you know blipping digits and or blip, blipping bits, rather. Uh, That's really good. I'm writing this down because uh, this this should be part of our marketing software interfaces for the real world. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I mean. But like, this is this is the trends that I that I see a lot as well because it's like, you know, there's there <laughs> there are gobs of software people. Hello to all of our software listeners, right? It's like yeah. <laughs> there's because there's there's money in it and there's there's just expertise around it and there's you know there's all these things that need software and so there's all these software people and now they want to get back into hardware. Um, or they need to do another thing, right? This is how you got started too, right? So people that don't Absolutely. remember your origin story, but it was like, yeah, you were trying to get Bluetooth access, right, from the software level. That's what Ubertooth was, right? Totally. Yeah. So I'm glad I, you know, I'll, I'll send you an invoice, by the way, for that, that's uh, <laughs> that brilliant, brilliant marketing, on-the-spot marketing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I that's... I just registered it with USPTO. Ah, so ah, unless you okay. got it before me. Okay, right. <laughs> Always register before talking to Osman. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> lesson learned. You know that will be an expensive one, but a lesson learned. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but I think that's that's super powerful too. I mean, I, that's that's the basis of what Arduino does that too. And you know, you think about Raspberry Pi, anything like that. It's people just want, and they don't. <laughs> now, from my perspective, I know that they most of them don't give a shit about <laughs> learning how a transistor works until it's necessary, right? It's like right. It's, I want to I want to do a thing, and if there's a software interface to do that, it's going to be a lot faster to do that thing, and it's probably faster just to buy to buy the thing that gives me that interface, right? Right. So, yeah. Right. Excellent. Yeah, and of course, everything we do is open source hardware, and we encourage people to build their own and modify things and get into the hardware design. But in reality, that's it's such a small percentage right. of folks who want to do that, uh, which is how we stay in business. Right, right. Do you have an estimate <laughs> on, on what that percentage would be? Oh, maybe one percent. Really? Okay. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah. I, in terms of like, I mean, if I think about all the people who've bought an Ubertooth versus all the people who've built an Ubertooth, it, oh, it's yeah. probably less than one percent. Yeah, but actually I was, built one. But if you if you if it was a different <laughs> pitch parts, that might be also that might change the story a little bit, right? Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah, you're right. I, I guess people I aren't know. building Arduinos as much as they're buying them, right? So and yeah, that's, that's large scale, simple stuff. So right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, bully for you. That's good for business. Uh, <laughs> it is good for business, yeah, but right. uh, that doesn't mean I don't want people to build their own. I, it really does excite me when 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 I meet somebody who shows me like one of my designs that they've built or done something interesting, like right. you know, made a variant of. That's that's super cool. Yeah, yeah. Like that's... that radio badge at uh, yeah. Chaos I was, camp a I was gonna mention that. that that had like that a was amazing hack RF on it, right? Like yeah. How, how did that end up going? I don't, I don't know. Did we talk about that last time or the time before? Uh, we probably we probably did talk about it, but I forget. Uh, but but yeah, just for, for people don't know, it was a a variant of Hacker F one that was um, 
that, that, that was put into the form of a conference badge uh, yeah. for the chaos communication and so camp. low cost <laughs> oh goodness it was not low cost at all but i mean it became lower cost because they got a lot of parts donated by chip vendors right. and which uh, is the way to do it of, right <laughs> yeah it totally is and so they made five thousand of the things and gave them away to people who came to the camp and uh, it was a terrific time a lot of people were doing fun stuff at the camp and people continue today to use the i mean i was just chatting with on irc like yesterday with somebody who was doing a project uh, with a radio badge interesting okay so that's that's always my question about badges i i you know because defcon's coming up which we'll talk about here in a a bit but like also because supercon's happening again and i'm helping with that and we're talking about badges and it's like do people actually use these things after the fact? I, I, my thesis is no, but maybe it's just because most badges aren't hack RFs built in. You know that? Yeah, that's kind of my impression too. Is that it, it depends a lot on the sophistication of the of the badge and the uh, general and the, the overall usefulness of the badge and what kind of support there is for it. Yeah, true. Uh, and I guess having the, five thousand in the field too—that just increases the number that are out there so that's you know it's if it's one if it's 0.1 percent you still have five people doing it then right <laughs> right <laughs> right it's, yeah versus and, you yeah. know 300 badges like well 0.3 people probably aren't reusing a badge right <laughs> right and one of the nice things about the radio badge is that since it is based on our product that we support uh it's relatively easy uh, you know and that that increases if you if you add up all the people who have other hack rfs uh, the the total number of people who have something vaguely similar that can help you out or right. collaborate on things is a very large group. Right. And uh, and also the the folks from the Munich uh, CCC group that put the badge to the, the radio badge together, uh, they've continued to to support the badge. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, in yeah, a like lot a of core ways. group. Yep. yep. Yeah. So it it really has has a, had a lot of mem- momentum behind it for something that's two years old it's pretty awesome that people are still using it yeah the tool chain is the same you're saying though too for that kind oh, of oh yeah okay yeah and we've actually uh it didn't happen right away because uh, the radio badge was was kind of a uh, a last uh, it, it, there was a kind of a mad rush to get the the firmware all working for it and everything so it took us a while but we did end up integrating and p- pulling all their code into the main hack rf tree oh wow uh, okay so That's cool. so like it's the same code base uh we all work together out of the same uh, the same code base and and uh you can download uh you know the the or co- you know clone our git repo and compile firmware for either hack rf one or the radio badge was it just uh, like a hash define or something yeah pretty much it's a little yeah. bit more complicated uh of a mod than um than it could have been largely because they they made some changes just to accommodate the what parts they were able to get donated oh i see yeah right so right. it's a bit more uh there's a fair bit to the uh the changes that they had to make to the firmware right uh, but we so they're actually like get... accessing different registers and stuff like that right like yeah well they have completely or... different chips oh. uh okay. in some cases like they're they're kind of in the in the analog rf section like the front end mixer and frequency synthesizer are completely different than we have on oh, yeah. rf one so like the whole all the stuff with tuning and 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 configuring the frequency synthesizer and stuff like that it is entirely different for theirs but they but they were able to fit it into the functions that we had already with hash defines and, and it works nice that's good i mean <laughs> In my my former days of uh, you know sustaining engineering, we would call that a bad idea. But um, <laughs> when there's a you know a willing group, then yeah, it sounds like it works. So <laughs> right, and the uh, and the folks who created that badge and created that firmware are still active in the Hacker FIRC channel, for example. Yeah, uh, right. So they're around and they're they're um, they help us out, and every once in a while we'll make a change. Uh, t- that we'll forget to test on radio badge and they'll tell us uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so it works it works pretty well that's great that's great so well speaking of badges let's 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 switch over to uh, conference mode because i know that's yeah. you were always i'm actually i was surprised that we were able to chat um 
it seems like you're always running around during conference season, so you've got a little bit of time at home at least. You are at home, right? You're not like, I am in a at hotel. Home. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm at home for like a month. Whoa. I know. Slacking off, Osman. What's going on? <laughs> uh, it's just that we have a lot of work to do to get ready for yeah. the next round of conferences. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, Black Hat and then DEF CON, which I'll be at yeah. DEF CON as well. Uh, Excellent. What else is on your on your docket in the coming days? Well, of course, there's Black Hat and DEF CON and now B-Sides, which is a younger oh, yeah. conference, but is also an excellent event that goes on that week in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, Dominic Spill and I have various things going on at, at all three of those events, actually. And uh, then that's that's kind of it for um, for a little while. Oh, okay. uh, I think my next conference after that will be TourCon in San Diego, which this year is in late August. It has previously been for for as long as I've been going. I think it's it's always been in October. Oh, okay, yeah. Now it's going to be like the end of August or very beginning of September. Luckily in San Diego, the weather is the same all year round, which is, this is true. gorgeous. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we won't. The only difference is there won't. That there will be fewer Halloween costumes. Right, and more tourists probably. But yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's cool. That's great. Um, uh, what are, are you? Do you reveal anything about what you're working on before you, or is it like you show up and you, you display what you've been working on? As these these are like hacks that you're just um, that you're presenting, or how does this work? So uh, I only have one. Um, well, I guess I have two talks. Uh, one is a talk that Dominic and I are doing at Black Hat on spectrum monitoring tools, cool. and the other one is one that I'm doing at the Wireless Village at DEF CON on reverse engineering direct sequence spread spectrum radio systems. Ooh, that sounds cool. Uh, and that's actually a talk that I have given once before uh, at recon in montreal last month and uh that's a kind of fun project but uh the the one we're doing at black hat is uh, is on spectrum monitoring tools and and we've we've been doing a lot of software work some of it's firmware work for HackRF, but a lot of it is software work uh on the host computer side for like rapid sweeping like you using a software defined radio platform yeah. more like a spectrum analyzer yeah right and, i remember i remember jared had that on the uh on the display that he built for it i forget what that's called the uh, porta pack porta pack yeah yeah so he has a really nice uh waterfall plot yeah. on the porta pack and that but it it's limited to a little less than 20 megahertz of bandwidth right that's right, visible at a time right so what we're working on now is sweeping across the full six gigahertz of oh, tuning range yeah 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 and we can sweep across that by, by doing the tuning in firmware instead of doing it on the host computer right we avoid like the usb latency with every tuning command right and right because you would normally be, you'd be saying like okay it's for a simple example send out one hertz send out 10 hertz send out 100 hertz right each time you have the overhead of all the usb stuff and then also getting the yep. data back right right so now what you're throwing into firmware you say you send a sweep command with some kind of parameters and it just does that for you and then sends back a stream of data or what Exactly. Okay. And uh, so we're getting six gigahertz of sweep in three quarters of a second. Uh, Whoa. So it's it's like an eight gigahertz per second sweep rate, uh, which, which is kind of ridiculous for um, like nobody's ever done anything near that fast before with kind yeah. of a general purpose. And how do, how do you how do you view platform. the data then? I mean, like. Well, that's exactly what we're working on now. Yeah. Uh, so oh, we this have is, this is the software interns, huh? <laughs> not exactly. Yeah, uh, they're doing little pieces of it, but yeah. kind of the the main the main most most important elements are things that we've done already. Uh, but uh, we're trying to add some extra features and get it polished in time right. for Black Hat. Uh, but the um, there are a few different tools available for actually visualizing that that information um w one of them is uh, a piece of software that we kind of found in the early days of working on this sweep stuff called q spectrum analyzer and it's a software tool that's specifically designed for uh, it was originally designed for rtl sdr okay that um, makes sense yep but 
it's specifically designed for using an RTL SDR as a spectrum analyzer. Uh, and but that's going to be R- super slow, right? It, it is super thing. slow. Yeah, it has right. a sweep rate. Uh, I don't even know what the sweep rate is, but it's like probably at least two orders of magnitude slower than yeah. what we have. Right. And uh, but it's it it's still useful for some things. Right. And so we kind of took that and said, hey, we can we can fairly easily integrate that with our sweep method and and make it go a whole lot faster. And so that was kind of the first tool that we had working. Cool. And and that was pretty useful. We we liked that a lot. But uh, but it has uh, the but there are some other benefits to some other tools that exist or other methods of visualization that exist that we wanted to kind of take advantage of and and so one thing we've done is this crazy trick that um, uh, is a little hard to explain because uh, it, it involves the FFT and the inverse FFT. Uh, but of course, these these uh, like the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, is an algorithm that's that's used to take the time domain information that comes over the USB cable from an SDR platform and turn it into frequency domain information right, that, right. that you like visualize in a waterfall or something like that. I was so, actually just uh, just I just explained that FFTs are more specifically Fourier transforms are the entire reason behind uh, the name contextual electronics. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, Tell me more. Uh, well, I, I explained it. I, I was, I've been streaming lately, so I explained it on there. But bas- the short version of it, and I may have explained it on here before, uh, is basically after three weeks of 40-hour homeworks in my signals class and not understanding what it was or why it was. Well, they told us what it was, right, going between time and frequency domain. But I didn't understand why that was important. And after the three ah. weeks and I finally figured it out, I was like, why the hell didn't they just show us a spectrum analyzer? Right? right. <laughs> that would have been context So in so many words. Yeah. <laughs> Like, God damn it. Like, why didn't they do that? They should have just done that. That would have been, it was like, oh, that's why it's important right there. He's like, oh, a sine wave. Look, a sine wave, single line on a spectrum chart, right? And now I'll go and do the math and I'll care about it. But God damn it. Like, that was terrible. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, that's cool. So, f- uh, fast Fourier transforms and inverse fast Fourier transforms. You're, so, you're just talking about going between the two, between the two domains, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, what we do when we're in sweep mode we get a short burst of time domain samples at every step along a, 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 lo- a wide range of frequencies. Mm-hmm. And so each one of those bursts, we we run the FFT on and we get some frequency domain information. Yeah. And then what, then what we do is we take an entire sweep worth of this FFT output and concatenate, concatenate it together as if all of, those fre- all of those frequency domain bins had come from a single FFT. Okay. And then we run the inverse FFT on that. Wow. And okay. So what that what that ends up producing, we basically we pretend that all of these frequency hops w- were captured simultaneously, but they really weren't. Right, of course. Uh and then uh but then we we take the inverse FFT and that gives us a larger chunk of uh like simulated very high sample rate time domain samples. Right, because what you really care about is you don't have all the data that's contained within each frequency hop, right? Because each frequency hop has some encoded data in there. But you want it you want to at least in the baseline, you want to know what the frequencies are and where it's hopping to, right? Yeah. Yeah. But and you know do you know, do you know the order as well? I mean, don't you need that? Um the order of hops? Yeah. I mean, it's algorithmic, right? Isn't it like? Uh... I mean, we're all we're kind of at this. If we're using this inverse FFT trick, which we don't all the time, it's just one trick we use for visualization. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we're using the inverse FFT trick, we're really just pretending that all of these hops happened at the same time, and that can result in some in some artifacts. Um, but if you're kind of aware that that trick is in use, it's right. a super useful trick. And and so we kind of we just totally ignore the fact that they they. Did not they, they did not occur at the exact same time, right? Uh, um, but we combine them together, and then we get this like, so if we're sweeping across six gigahertz, we get this simulated six giga sample per second time domain signal, uh, except that it has it has like a big gap. It's a it's a very short burst of yeah. six yeah. giga sample per second, and then there's a little then there's a gap to the next sweep. Yep. And then there's another short burst at six giga samples per second. And because we have these these bursts at six giga samples per second simulated, we can pipe them into all kinds of other tools that 
have the ability to do analysis or visualization uh, of time domain signals. Huh. And uh, and we found that this is a, a very useful trick for uh, kind of kind of wedging our sweep solution into a bunch of existing software tools for visualization. Oh, interesting. That, yeah. Without having to actually modify those tools. Got it. That's interesting. Yeah. So like the, the thing I wonder about is like, so when I was asking about visualization of this stuff is just, it's like a, it's a, what's it called? Dynamic range problem, right? So if you're looking at six gigahertz and you see a spike at five gigahertz, if you're looking at the full spectrum of six gigahertz, and you see a spike mm -hmm. at five gigahertz, you don't necessarily have any detailed information about that spike. That's kind of the, the resolution problem, right? Or sorry, the dynamic range problem. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think the dynamic range really, uh, I don't think there's anything different about the dynamic range that we get using this sweep trick versus the dynamic range we get using other methods. Well, okay. So what I'm saying is, okay, so now assuming there's a spike at five gigahertz, right? You don't know if it's happening at 5.1 or five or 4.9, right? Because you don't have that range uh, there. Oh, right. Well, we, we actually do, um, it, it may take more CPU time to to process to get uh -huh. that um, that frequency uh, resolution, but uh, but we do have the data that that shows us. Um, I, I don't want to say arbitrarily narrow frequency resolution, but the, the the amount of the amount of frequency resolution we get is, uh, or, or how fine that resolution is, is proportional to the number of samples that we capture at every at any individual hop right right and, and that, but like that's just a display problem too i'm saying like so right so if you're right. sampling so the way i think about it right you're sampling zero one two three four five six gigahertz right just saying at each frequency you're outputting this frequency you're seeing what comes back in terms of amplitude you map it on a plot right right but in order to get resolution around the five where you see the spike around five you would need to to then sample 4.8, 4.95, 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and then see, oh, well, that energy is actually at 4.9 instead right. of 5, right? Right. So, and that's actually, that's really related to the thing that we're working on now, the uh -huh. thing that isn't quite complete, but that we're hoping to show at Black Hat, is that we're taking a, an interesting web-based uh, SDR software tool called Shiny SDR, uh -huh. and we're modifying it so that, it kind of has the ability to go back and forth between sweep mode and kind of normal capture, like narrow band capture mode. Yeah, right, right, right. Yep. And so you can you can drill down into things really easily, mm -hmm. and then zoom back out into sweep mode. Oh, and, cool! And that and will actually do, control the radio eventually as well. So it'll like just change the the sweep frequencies, like the, exactly. The, oh, yeah, that'll yeah. be really cool. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the part of this project that's still in progress, but mm -hmm. uh, you know we have a couple weeks left. Uh, <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, what you, and have, what, you, what are you trying to solve with this stuff. though? What do you? I mean, are you trying? So you mentioned spread spread spectrum. Is it because of that? Is it the tools are insufficient for that, or something else? No, that's kind of a completely different project, although okay. maybe related in certain cases. Sure. But um, it, it, we've been doing kind of SDR within the security space for a long time. And and when people from the information security world kind of learn about SDR, one of the frustrations that, that they often have, or, what, or I should say actually one of the things they get excited about at first, is that they think that this is going to be an easy way for them to start, um, start detecting and analyzing radio signals that they ha never had visibility to before. Uh -huh. So like, w what if you're, you're in charge of security for, uh, for a facility or something where you, you what have if, a building? What, what if you're at a conference and you're trying to look for the pineapples that are, are hanging out all over? <laughs> Did you watch that episode of, uh, of Silicon Valley? <laughs> uh, actually, no, I haven't. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I stopped having a TV before that episode came out. Got it, right. But right. Uh, HBO HBO Now, man. HBO Now. That's yeah. The, that's the way to do yeah. it. All or, right. Or your or, or your local uh, torrent if you're if you're it's of a that persuasion. Show, yeah. But I know uh you know, I know what that episode was based on. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, right. But uh like even going beyond Wi Fi shenanigans, mm -hmm. um there like we, we have pretty good tools in the in the 
information security world for dealing with Wi-Fi. Um, sure. We right. don't have good tools for dealing with your random Internet of Things Pirate uh, signals. Wireless no? <laughs> interfaces. Right. Yeah. Right. Rogue devices. That's that, right. That yeah, somebody right. brings into your building. It's and... not 900 megahertz. It's 800 megahertz. Bum, bum, <laughs> bum. <Right. laughs> yeah, well, it's amazing. Like, just just doing a simple variation like that. You could take some off the shelf, uh, really easy to detect uh, an interface with kind of radio solution and make some tiny little tweak, like just right. run it on change, a different frequency. As you say, change the inductor. And, uh, yeah. and, right, and you'd be tune, amazed tune yeah. <laughs> by like how blind people are to you know, to it. Like they'll never find it. Yeah, uh, unless true. you use something like a spectrum analyzer, some kind of spectrum monitoring solution. Yeah, and, but doesn't this throw so many false positives for people that are getting started where they're like, oh no, there's... There's a signal on three gigahertz. It's like, yeah, well, it's a satellite or whatever, you know, like <laughs> absolutely, yeah. or or like that's your CPU clock. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> calm down, Fritz. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, and that and so that's a real challenge for people who are new to this. If they if they want to use these tools to try to detect like signals that shouldn't be there, uh, first of all, they have to have some way to get a baseline and detect signals that should be there. And so one of the things that we're really focusing on in shiny sdr is that um it, and our our interns ellie and jacob are working on this right now is enhancing the the method of annotation that's Aha, available that's within great. shiny sdr so yep. that you can like an overlay of, of, a, of a spectrum chart yeah exactly oh, so you God. can map yeah. things out and, and so if you find something and you figure out what it is mm -hmm. you can annotate it and then it'll show up annotated the next time you look at it oh there's no like like encyclopedia Work, look up though or anything like that it's... well we're kind of working on that side too okay. yeah. which is which is being able to pull in information more easily from public data yeah. sources right, that have right, right. Uh, you know information about spectrum usage right. uh, so it's a combination of getting uh kind of open source intelligence uh, like uh published information about spectrum usage and then also combining that with uh you know your own annotations that you you can make yeah like this this is something that we have in our facility and it's noisy at 900 megahertz and you can keep track of that thing yeah <laughs> so that means at some point there's going to be like a, a, a uh, annotated version of uh the uh, annotated rf version of test post please ignore is that kind of uh <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> probably we know this device is crap please ignore it it's fine right. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly wow that's interesting so and so this isn't because what I was thinking about is like I thought you were talking about it in terms of sp spread spectrum because one of the problems with that as far as I understand it is that first you have to know where all the hops are going and then what you'd really want to do is like kind of camp out on those on those hops and try and catch the information that's happening as it as that goes right yeah and there are there are a few different forms of spe spread spectrum communication that are popular and the one you're mentioning uh, sounds like frequency hopping spread spectrum yeah right uh, yep. which is which is what bluetooth famously does and there are a number of other systems that use frequency hopping as well um and but the other very popular method of spread spectrum is direct sequence spread spectrum which stays on the same frequency the whole time but has a really wide bandwidth uh signal and and so um you don't have to tune around to different frequencies, but you do have to capture kind of a wide range of frequencies all at once. Oh, so in you, order change, you change your filter analyze it. internally instead of changing your whole tuning front end type thing? Y yeah, basically. And the, uh, I mean, the way, the way that direct sequence spread spectrum works in a nutshell is it takes advantage of the fact that as you increase the data rate of a signal, like the number of bits per second that you send, the bandwidth of the signal, the width in hertz, actually uh is proportional to that mm. so 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 faster you, signal tighter uh narrower bandwidth no uh, faster no? signal wider bandwidth really wait yeah. how does that work then doesn't that clog like, up the that that block that you're talking about uh it uses more bandwidth if you increase the data rate of a signal oh interesting okay. so what 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 people do to to if you're designing a spread a direct sequence spread spectrum uh, system, what you do is you artificially inflate the data rate. So instead of transmitting like one symbol for every bit, you transmit a whole bunch like a big pattern of symbols for every bit for every data bit that you want to transmit. 
And and so it becomes like every time you want to transmit a, a data one, you transmit a, a long pattern of, of, <laughs> right. of symbols. And if you want to transmit a data zero, you transmit the inverse pattern. And so you're constantly transmitting these patterns and the, and the pattern has a, a bit rate, well, we call it a chip rate, um, that is much, much faster than the actual data rate. And that means that the resulting signal has much, much more bandwidth. Interesting. And that makes it more immune to noise and interference because uh, you don't have to capture one individual chip. You just have to sort of do a pattern match and recognize that something that vaguely looks like the pattern that represents a one occurred versus the inverse pattern that represents a zero. Okay. So it's it's a completely different sort of so technology like, than like frequency a- hopping spread spectrum, but they both result in using a wider bandwidth in Hertz and the radio spectrum than you would use with a, a sort of a, a more naive uh, narrow band approach. And so is that chip uh, code? So if the code is, if I send Chris Gamel is a one and Mike Osman is a zero, right? Is it like, is it? I don't know, like where you're going with this. What's that? You're calling me a zero? Oh, sorry. Mike Osmond's is a one, and Chris Gamble's a zero. Yeah, you're right. I should have. Well, I'm a terrible host. I should have. I should have made you a one. Mike, you know what? You are. You are a one. I'm sorry. You're a one too, Chris. <laughs> oh, thanks. But you know what? Now we don't have any data. So, uh, all right. So Mike yeah. Osmond's a one, and Chris Gamble's a zero. And uh, is the idea basically like because I'm sending that faster and faster and faster, eventually that even though it looks like Chris Schmummer, that like you at least see the Chris, and so like because. Not all the data exactly. get through. It looks enough like Chris rather than Mike. It looks more Mike. like Chris than Mike, and so you, so the receiver knows that it was a one. Interesting. Yep. No, that's really cool, actually. That's it's like data or information theory type stuff, or what? Very much so. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact, the uh, the fact that bandwidth is proportional to data rate comes from uh, the Shannon theorem. Claude Shannon. Uh, that guy's a badass. Was a badass. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the uh, the. The theorem that describes uh, the theoretical limit of how much of channel capacity, like how how yeah. many, many bits per second you can fit through a channel of a given bandwidth at a given signal to noise ratio. Right, right, right. Because if you if you were, if you know you're going to go really fast, then what you do is a zero would be Chris Gamel is a one, but we're going to use his name as a zero, and then the one would be. Mike Osman's always a one. He'll always be a one, folks. Come on. <laughs> that would be like you would just make the word longer, right? That's the idea. Right, right. Yeah. The the longer your word is, or the longer your code is. Yeah. Right. Uh, then the easier it is for the receiver to detect that pattern, uh, which means that you're more immune to noise and interference, um, and you can have a signal to noise ratio that is extremely poor. In fact, you, oftentimes in these kinds of systems, you have a negative signal to, to noise ratio. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And so uh, doesn't yeah, that so take, the, I mean, so I guess you're, you're clocking it through faster, but it's all going, I mean, radio is serial, right? I mean, like you're still, is that right? Or I guess you could have it, you don't encode it in the frequency, do you? No, not typically. I mean, it is possible to have, um, um, uh, well, actually, that's an interesting question. I never really thought about it. As I'm just wondering, serial, like when, when you serial pro- versus parallel. Yeah, but. like when you when you process this this code word, as I'm going to call it, even though I know it's a chip or whatever, uh, is it going through a shift register or is it doing something more paralleled? Uh, so it's typically going through uh, the correlation algorithm, uh, which is a multiply accumulate function. Oh, like in an FPGA. Okay, so then that sure. probably has some some parallel components to it. It might not be all parallel, but it's. Right, because it's okay. going to be analyzing like uh, what it receives over a chunk of time. Sure. Uh, uh, like a, a not just an instant, but a, a but a, a period of time. Yeah. Uh, to see if what it received during that window of time uh, looks like the pattern that it's it's looking for. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then it outputs like some stochastic like this is a fifteen percent likelihood of being a one or a. 99% likelihood of being a one or another. Right. right. And if yeah. the transmitter is clocking out these these codes at a reg, at a periodic uh, interval, mm-hmm. then the receiver is going to start seeing that there are these spikes in correlation at, at that uh, hmm. expected period and kind of lock onto those. This is That's... this is how GPS works by the way. 
Oh, really? I didn't uh, know that, actually. Yeah, like, the, you know, the, those GPS uh, signals come from satellites that are a long way away from you, and they have a very limited power budget. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> and, and so... And there's like a they, bunch of them, too. Like, that's what's crazy, too. Yeah, and so the receiver... Uh, it, it, that's how they overcome the fact that they have s- such a terrible signal to noise ratio at the receiver mm-hmm. is that they transmit uh, every time they want to transmit one bit of information, they actually transmit 1,023 chips and the receiver is correlating to try to do a pattern match and detect uh, those 1,023 chips. That's cool. And, and, and that's uh, obviously done in... I mean, that's not done in FPGAs these days. There's custom silicon for that kind of stuff, but sure. What is that? But a, I've definitely a, seen it done in FPGAs. But, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or actually on host computers, like there, there's SDR software oh, yeah. you can use to to do GPS oh, cool. receiving um, or GPS simulation, which is a lot of fun. Um, like like messing with people's GPS or what? Uh, I guess you're not outputting the frequency that's necessary. Well, you could be. Um, that's that's become rather popular. Uh, really? Oh, that's well, like that's like in Goldeneye. Oh my God, we're there. The, yeah, yeah. The normal I people mean, are, are are steering the ships off course now, huh? I mean, have you seen uh, Pokemon Go? Yeah, sure. So the, I'll just say that uh, GPS simulation software for SDR became a lot more popular when Pokemon Go came out. Those fat asses that don't want to get up <laughs> and walk around. What the hell? <laughs> that, is that seriously why? Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, there are, there are plenty of other uses. Never for it, and... underestimate the depths of human laziness. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> seriously, like though, like Pokemon Go. Okay, I didn't really enjoy it that much myself. But like the fact, like all the stories you heard about, like I walked 14 miles yesterday, and like people like losing 50 pounds because they're just like walking around playing Pokemon. Like that's that's great. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Except yeah. for the kid that walked, there, there was some people that like walked into dangerous places or off cliffs or something. That was sad, but but yeah. otherwise, you know, healthy. You know, to a certain extent, that's going to happen just when people get out more. That's true, right? Like, right. I wouldn't necessarily blame Pokemon for that, but that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of interesting things that that folks do with GPS. Um, there was a really cool paper, by the way, um, a few years ago that was one of my favorite. Uh, papers in the field of wireless security uh, called GPS software attacks that showed um, uh, that showed how you could like spoof a GP- GPS signal and cause that to affect a GPS receiver in some interesting ways. And and what they did was they 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 made a the reason I like this paper is because they make a very good uh, distinction a very clear distinction between kind of a, a RF level attack versus a software attack. And in, in that, like, if you just think about GPS, GPS spoofing as an RF level attack, you can think, okay, I can make a receiver think it's somewhere on the earth where it's not. But sure. if you go beyond that, you can, you can use this technique to exploit software bugs in the GPS receiver. So for example, they found that they could spoof a GPS signal that looked like it had an elevation of zero, meaning it meaning that the GPS receiver thinks it's at the center of the earth. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when they did this, they actually got a GPS receiver s- software to crash. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, because it did like a division cause, by zero or something. Right, exactly. Or, or the, uh, the, the QA team probably didn't think to check that kind of thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And wow. so there were the, they found that there were these software bugs that they were able to exploit um, beyond just fooling the thing to think it's in a different location. Jeez. It's pretty cool. Okay. Now here's an interesting loop back question for you. Since uh, Great Scott Gadgets is enabling the uh, you know software people to talk to the world, does this mean that software people are going to introduce more bugs into the, heart, into the real world because you're giving access to... Uh, you know, software interfaces to the to real things. Is that is that a concern of yours? Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by um, like producing bugs. Like everyone who produces software produces bugs. That's just the way uh, of the world. I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure, you don't. No, no, I just don't produce software, so that helps. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, but uh, the you know the folks that that I hang out with and who give talks at hacker cons and stuff. Um, 
even if they're talking about vulnerabilities and things that they've discovered, um, it's important to realize that they're not breaking things. They're just pointing out how things were already broken. Hmm. This is uh, this is part of the ethics conversation, I think. Again, right? This is. I think uh, so. Yeah. yeah. When Fitz was on, we were talking about this stuff. Um, sure. Yeah, Fitz was on a couple weeks ago. Yeah, right. A couple months ago, whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of Joe Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Uh, I think he mentioned the uh, the training that he's doing this fall, hardware security training. Yeah. Yeah. And so did Dimitri. Dimitri was the uh, the 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 salesman on that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I wanted to mention this because I joined their group. I heard. Yeah, it's like uh, so now it's become like the hardware security mafia. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's it's kind of a fun uh fun group because there are five of us and every single one of us has been a guest on the amp hour. Oh, I know. I I've yeah. taken I've taken uh you know, I've basically put that whole thing together, you know. Again, <laughs> the the invoice is in the mail. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So Joe Fitzpatrick, Dmitry Notasbasov, Joe Grand, Colin O'Flynn, and myself. Uh, we're all doing this thing, uh, and one of the it's in November in San Francisco, and so we're all, these are classes that we've all done at various events in the information security community. But we just decided to put on our own event, um, and uh, I think yeah. largely Joe was the uh, Fitz was the ringleader of it, and uh, maybe Dimitri too. But anyway, the five of us are are collaborating, and we uh, one of the things that uh, one of the recent developments here. Uh, apart from me joining that group, is that we have a uh, call for papers. What? Um, oh, like it's turning a, into a conference. Don't do it. It's sort of a mini conference, but only for people who are attending our training. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. So, so the way we're doing it is we're doing the, our trainings together over a four-day period, and we're all going to have lunch together. And during the lunch hour, we're going to have somebody give a talk. Ah, okay. And so... If you want to give a talk at that, that those are, there are four slots, I think, um, to give a talk. Ah. And if we select your talk, we'll let you go to one of our trainings for free. Nice. So, this is like this is like a raffle, but a raffle based on on awesome papers. Right. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully this means we'll have some really great talks uh, from some cool people who want to come do our trainings for free. And uh, so if folks have interesting projects especially projects that are hardware security related yep uh then uh, go to hardwaresecurity.training and you can um pitch your pitch your talk to us and maybe get one of our trainings for free nice well i would be remiss if i didn't mention uh the conference that exists the week after the weekend after your that's training, right uh, which I'm is going the, from one straight to the other yeah hackaday supercon which is up in la or down in LA, I suppose, from from San Francisco, where you'll be. Uh, yeah, we're looking for speakers as well. So that yep. was a good time last year. And you you didn't get it? No, you were at some other conference last year. Yeah, so. I couldn't go last year, but two years yeah. ago I had a great time. Oh yeah, because that was the one in San Francisco, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was excellent. Yeah. No, it's a good group, and I'm excited about it. So if people are interested, there are also CFP for that is out. So cool. Um, yeah, that's going to be an interesting burst of travel for me but uh yeah um but, but at hey, least it's san not, francisco and la are not too far apart yeah, i was gonna say at least it's not the desert for two weeks <laughs> <laughs> right uh speaking of so what should i expect from defcon this year I, I i actually was surprised there's no there's no badge this year there's no official badge rather right well i don't know what they're doing for i mean i assume they'll have something like yeah, a paper, like paper badge, badge or something for, yeah whatever uh but they they i guess had some plans for an electronic badge that fell through uh, yeah, something that I saw the person who was doing, it, I think they had family things come up. So, I mean, like, uh, it's not like I'm super, I was never that into those badges anyways. Uh, I was. Really? Uh, especially during the years that Joe Grand was doing them. Oh, sure. Well, I was never at those, though. Yeah. Uh, the, that w- those were in the years when I was just first getting interested in hardware. And, uh-huh. like, and getting to getting to hack on that badge every year was a big part of how I got into hardware. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so that was propellers usually, wasn't it? Isn't that what Joe usually uses? It's propellers, uh, or, not, or used... sorry, uh, not propellers. The uh, parallax stuff, though, right? Yeah, he's done a lot of parallax stuff. But in those years, like I remember a couple of or two or three years that there were some uh, freescale chips. Okay. Uh, like there was a there were two years in a row where he used this freescale DSP chip, and uh, that was super interesting. That was that was 
really right around the time when I was learning hardware hacking and um, and I did some stuff like I, I tried to compete in the like the badge hacking contest, but I was a newbie and I didn't do very well. Uh, but like the second year he had that DSP chip, I did or maybe yeah, I think it was the second year I did. Uh, I tried to turn my toy guitar into a like a digital electric guitar nice uh, <laughs> and uh, i never really finished that project i only got as far as as getting the built-in uh uh stroboscopic tuner working oh okay. which which yeah. was super fun yeah uh, no that's great it's actually. Like, it was yeah. like i had an rgb led under each of the six strings like mounted in the guitar uh-huh. a- and then the 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 uh red green and blue would flash mm-hmm. uh in, you know in a one at a time at the rate that the string is vibrating or supposed to be vibrating. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can see like a circle of these three colors kind of rotate around each other uh, as right. like, and they rotate faster the further the string is out of tune. Right. Which is like kind how the old, the old tuners worked anyways. Right. There was like the, yeah. 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 So anyway, that we was, that was in... one of my early, early hardware hacking projects was doing that with one of Joe Grant's, uh, Defcon badges. Well, that is, I suppose, as a vector for software people to get into hardware. So I can't, I can't argue with that. Um, yeah, yeah. I saw that new. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm in love with the uh, the and and not XOR, however you say it. Yeah, that's one of the groups. They they have right. a they did Bender last year. The Bender, then, yeah, yeah. And this year it's Bender though, as uh, as the doctor, not as a doctor, as as uh, Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing. Uh, so he's got like the cigarette coming out of his mouth. He looks like right. like Hunter S. Thompson. So it's <laughs> it's just really good design. I love it. It's so it's so funny. So nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, there's going to be uh, a lot of interesting stuff at DefCon, of course. Of course. Anything uh, in particular you're look, you're looking forward to? That's the thing. I I I, I know I'm going now. Um, I yeah. I know it's in a different venue than before, so that's kind of interesting. I hate Vegas. Uh, that's the thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> I really, really don't like Vegas, and uh, but I want to go. I love f- Vegas for about twenty four hours. Sure, yeah. But, uh, right. At the end of like day nine, I'm yeah. pretty down I mean, on. Just Vegas. like the sound of slot machines really gets me. Ugh. Mm. Ugh. Yeah. No, I don't like it. Um, and I should say, I, I love gambling. That's part of the problem. Like, <laughs> oh, I hate losing. Uh, that's the that's the other problem. Uh, so, anyways, yeah, I, I just don't I don't like going there anymore. Um. But yeah, so uh, I guess I'm interested. I'm going to go to Hardware Hacking Village. I don't think I'm going to do... I, I was talking to Crux about uh, the Darknet badge mm-hmm. and Darknet as in general. I didn't quite get that in previous years, but it seems like that's actually an educational program. Like it goes, takes you through... Right. What like what, what does it do? Like soldering and then is there any SCR stuff or no? Honestly, I've never done it, oh, okay. um, but it looks super cool. Yeah. Uh, and they've been doing it for a few years now. Um, maybe three ish, something like that. And, um, and I know that there's a series of challenges, uh, and I think they're going even kind of bigger this year because it seems like they're starting some, I'm seeing some things on Twitter that like, uh, you, there's, they're starting the challenge even before DEF CON starts, I think. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, cool. Uh, so it looks really interesting. Uh, I would definitely recommend people check that out because it, it, it relates like hardware hacking and software hacking and kind of uh, privacy and um, dark network kind of like uh, yeah. covert communication kind right, of stuff. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and it, of, seems, it seems like it's like education, but it, that's the secondary thing that happens. It's more like people are doing it for the challenges and to get through it. Um, yeah. And it, I guess that's kind of like how I've started to view DEF CON as well. It, it almost seems like it's like a, like an MMORPG or whatever that's called. Whatever, whatever... Uh, 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 World of Warcraft is right where you have like you have all these different missions going on anyways right you can't you can't do all of it you can't go to all the talks you can't do all the demos you can't you know do everything there but most people just pick one and focus on it that year and, yeah like uh, I remember like Alvaro he did that are they still do laser shooting or no like there was like robots that were uh, target practicing or something right like that. yeah Alvaro was really into that yeah. um, and I don't recall uh, seeing it I don't know if they're still doing that, but mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's still a uh, robot auto-targeting challenge of some sort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I mean, but even like so, like Hardware Hacking Village kind of stands on its own now as well, right? Yep, that's a thing. Uh, so I 
I sometimes hang out in the hardware hacking village, sometimes hang out in the wireless village. Um, there's an interesting uh, thing that some hardware folks might be interested in, which is the uh, the ICS village, the industrial control systems village. Oh, I'm definitely going there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool that's a cool program. Oh, uh, Dimitri was doing a bunch of stuff with what that wasn't he? Like, wasn't he consulting on ICS type stuff? Uh, yeah, he's definitely done a lot of that yeah. kind of work. Uh, and and, and of- personally, I th- I think that stuff is super important because well, first off, I've worked I've worked in an industrial controls company, and I know I've heard conversations that I've, <laughs> that security is not a huge focus. Let me just say that, and it should be because it's like like controls your water and your power and your you know your sewer and ev- like everything is you know SCADA systems are big, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of money and or problems there. So yeah, definitely, <laughs> it's a. It's a major area uh, of, of focus for the whole hardware security community, yeah. definitely. What about um, automotive? Is there an automotive village or no? Like, is there uh, you focus know, I don't that? recall if there's an automotive village, uh, but there will certainly be a talk or two on automotive stuff. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, there's one. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um I was going to say, how do, you, how do you pick out your talks and stuff, too? Like, because there usually are pretty big lines for talks and stuff. You usually have to get their early lineup, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, this one is called Driving Down the Rabbit Hole. Um, mm, and it's I like that. By, by some folks that I know in um, from Portland, uh, okay. Mickey and Jesse and Alex. Uh, a- Alex actually is one of the chipset guys. Oh, cool. Uh, um, and, anyway, they're doing a talk on... Um, kind of automotive security research that I'm looking forward to. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, I choose talks. Well, f- I, I uh, one of the problems with DEF CON is also one of the great things about DEF CON is that there's so much going on that it's sometimes hard to know what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, and like, you cannot see all the talks. And if you even try to see a good number of talks, then you'll miss out on a bunch of other interesting right. activities. And right. so you have to... You have to kind of accept the fact that you're not going to do it all and just find one or two things that really interest you and roll with that. Okay. Um, and if that's going to talks, then great. Um, and uh, so oftentimes, and also I have a lot of things going on. So like I might have a talk or I might have, a, uh, I'm not doing a, a regular talk at DEF CON this year, but I'm doing a talk in the wireless village. And I also am showing a couple things at the DEF CON demo labs, uh, which is like a, uh, you know, a couple you, couple hours where you have a demo table to show people things. Oh, cool. Okay. And so I'm doing those things and maybe some other things. And I have other things going on in Vegas that week, so like a black hat. And so, <laughs> so it's you just might just a, be in your room napping at some point. You're like, exactly. Just it's, F a, it. <laughs> it's a busy time and yeah. I'm there for 10 days. And right. like sometimes I just have to say, you know what? This afternoon I need to yeah. go hang out by the pool. Yep. Uh, yep. 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 And that's totally fine. But, um, but I do like to try to see some talks and and it is hard to get into talks sometimes. And this may change depending now that it's in a bigger venue, it might be easier to get into talks, but I'm sure it'll still be hard to get into yeah. some of the more popular there'll, talks. There will at least be long lines at the very least, right? Probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, but there's a great trick. If you are staying in the conference hotel or know somebody who's staying in the conference hotel, DEF CON has done this for many years, uh, this wonderful thing called DEF CON TV, where they give a live feed of all of their lecture halls. On different, Each one is on a different TV channel that you can get in the hotel room. And so... <laughs> Did you see it, how much it costs to stay at the, the friggin... <laughs> yeah, but I bet you Roman know somebody... Roman Village, whatever they call it? I, forget I bet you know somebody who has a room at Caesars. Got it, Caesars. So... Yeah. So what you do is you like offer that person beer and you say, uh-huh. let's go hang out in your room and watch these these talks that I really want to see. It's real weird. Well, it's like, hey, let's go hang out in your room. I brought beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Dom, that was... Dominic constantly gives me shit about that because uh, <laughs> like the, the way we for, we met on the internet. and like uh, <laughs> Unintentional first, DEF CON dating. That's what it the is. The first right? time we met in person, like yeah. pretty much the first thing I talked to him is, hey, you want to go up to my hotel room so we can work on our talk for tomorrow? <laughs> and like he's, he's always reminding me that uh, – that like the first thing I did when I met him was invite him to my hotel. Solicit room. him for for hacking. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh no, no. That's I, I, I got similarly <laughs> creepy looks, and I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. I'm me, me and uh, my co-host have never met, so I'm flying down to Australia to meet him. 
Right. Oh, okay, Chris. Yeah, well, hope you don't get hacked to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Dave's, Dave's fine. He's fine. That's yeah. good. I'm glad yeah. you're still alive. Yeah, exactly. Me too. You know what? Me too. <laughs> I'm actually a ghost. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't so. actually seen you in person since then. That's a good point. I, I might I, I don't even know if I exist. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is so there, yeah, look, is there... look for talks that you want to see, and if you're concerned about actually getting into them, see if you can catch them on DefCon TV or catch them, you know, when they're published online afterwards. Yeah, right. Uh, right. Although that that has the hazard that you might forget. Sure. Right. Um, what about? So this is I'm looking at the main DefCon schedule. Is there a separate schedule just for like the talk you're doing at like at uh, Harbor Village? Is there? Does Harbor Village have its own site? Hardware Village, I don't know. Um, they at least have a forum in the DEF CON forums. Okay. Um, I don't know if they have their own website. Uh, the Wireless Village has, it, which is where I'm doing a talk, has oh, okay. uh, a site, which is wirelessvillage.ninja. As uh, you do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the schedule's up there. There are some okay. interesting talks going on there. And in addition to talks, uh, one of the... One of the highlights of the wireless village is that they have this wireless CTF, which is a um, a game, like uh -huh. a, a competition that goes throughout the weekend. That's a whole lot of fun. I definitely recommend people check that out. Yeah, and um, yeah, there there are all these different things going on, and they're not necessarily all going to show up on the DefCon website. Right, 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 right. That's one thing that. So, like last time I went, I was kind of just like, oh, I'll just kind of see what happens, and it felt like I uh, I missed some things just because I didn't plan at all. And this year I'm mm. going to plan a little bit better and try and be at certain places. Like I, I would walk in the heart, the, the hacking village, right? And it would be like, there's like no one in here. There's nothing going on, right? And so it just, it was hard to tell when there was activity in certain areas. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It definitely is a good idea to go through the schedule and, and look for things ahead of time. So you, uh, you know, you have the opportunity then to, to pick out the things that are most important to you to, to find. And, mm -hmm. and if you, if you do one or two things that you're really excited about and then you wander the rest of the time, you'll probably have a great time. Yep. And I did find the hardware hacking villages, dchhv.org. So that is, oh, if people are just listening and not clicking on link, we'll have all this stuff in the link in the show notes too. So fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. I was just looking at the, um, DEF CON schedule as we were talking here and I forgot that, uh, Nate is giving a talk. Um, from SparkFun. Oh, really? Cool. Uh, at DEF CON this year. Open source safe cracking robots. Oh, that just sounds hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we've had, uh, you know, a, a decent number of, of security people on the show before, so hopefully they'll all be there. Um, yeah. I know Joe's giving a talk, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, let's see. I'm not sure if. How many of your other former guests? Uh, I know some, Dimitri, some Dimitri said he wouldn't be there, but uh, Joe He's giving Grand. A, uh, Joe Grand is usually there, but I don't yeah. know if he has a talk. Uh, Colin O'Flynn has a talk at uh, Black Hat. That looks pretty good. Yeah, and uh, and that's um, also happens to be on uh, on locks, not safe cracking, but electronic door locks. Oh, cool! Um, like uh, uh, those, uh, like Lockatron and stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. Oh, cool. So he's doing some kind of attacks on those uh, that I presume uses side channel analysis. Right. Uh, <laughs> since that's his area of expertise. The thing is about electronic door locks is even better than side channel analysis, usually side window analysis usually, uh, you know, <laughs> lets, you, lets you into the place faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I don't, it's, yeah. Are, are you... Um, are you going to, do you bring, do you like, do you watch the spectrum as you're there? Like, do you ever do stuff like that or no? Not much. No. Uh, unless I have a particular thing going on, like I'm working on a contest or something. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, I, I the, I've been watching all these badges come out and it's like everybody threw an ESP 8266 on there. So I think it'll be extra interesting watching, watching what happens and just in terms of like traffic on the networks and stuff like that. There will be a lot of, I think there'll be a lot more small devices on the network. Or, or even probably more likely, you know, outputting their own uh, access point information. Um, so it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see all that stuff this year and in subsequent years as there's just, you know, Wi-Fi chips are all over the place. Yeah, totally. 
yeah, it, it's kind of amazing how how that has exploded in the last couple of years. Are you, are you doing anything with those chips or no? Not currently. Uh, there, there, there are some fairly limited options, I think, for using those really low-cost Wi-Fi implementations uh, to do things that are more interesting with Wi-Fi, like uh, raw frame injection and monitor mode and stuff that that folks can do with off-the-shelf Wi-Fi cards on a laptop, for example. Oh, gotcha. Uh, okay. So for as a security researcher, those parts aren't particularly interesting, except in the way that the, you mentioned that they kind of affect the overall landscape of what Wi-Fi devices are out there. Right, right. Yeah, there'd be a lot of tiny, tiny honeypot set up, right? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. entirely possible. Yeah, it's like, oh, I attacked this device and there was barely a file system on there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, I should I should say that I, I'm some for some reason I'm thinking about like, I mean, not some reason. I, I I will be on VPNs and you know all that stuff. I I don't know if there's actually ever any reason to worry about that. I know that I've read I've read in both directions. It's like don't don't bother, you know. Yeah. But, th- but then there's always. Yeah, people aren't going to burn their O day on you at DEF CON. Right. Most likely. Probably not. Right. <laughs> um, but you do need to take you know precautions right. that you would take anywhere certainly. See, and that's the big difference. I think Fitz mentioned that too, that he was talking about... V- oh, yeah, because he mentioned he turned off his VPN to be on the show, which is... And obviously you have as well, because your audio quality is very good. Um, <laughs> Osman is vulnerable. Get him. <laughs> <laughs> I've been attacking your network this whole time, Mike. You oh, never man. saw me coming. <laughs> this is this is for stealing that phrase that I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, you sh- probably should be on VPNs these days. and Yeah. You don't do like tour stuff, do you? Uh, occasionally. Really? I never yeah. I never did that. I mean, I've done VPNs a lot, but never tour. So I never yeah, quite figured I'm not, that out. Um, uh, I think that tour is very interesting. I'm, I'm more interested in it from an academic standpoint than I am as a user. Uh, what, in what way? Um, well, it, it's uh, like no one's really been able to prove one way or another whether or not... Um, whether or not it's possible for Tor to really work, like <laughs> I mean, oh, is that Tor all? does Tor does work to a great extent, right? But but, to but what until ex- it's been broken and until someone's like, nope, I broke it, you don't know what the limits are, right? Well, I mean, uh, there's a there's a theoretical problem that is kind of more interesting to me than the practical problem, I guess, which is like, is it po- is it possible in theory? to actually anonymize internet traffic. Uh, Just like given, inform- going back to information theory again? It, yeah, very much so. Um, but but more focused on like, if, if you assume that your, um, if, you, if you assume that your adversary has the ability to monitor the network in multiple places, then uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to come up with a method that would that would kind of make your internet traffic immune uh, to being detected uh, or being picked out as being yours, and um, it it's an interest it's a very interesting problem I think. But so it's, it's like if so if uh, a, a bad actor was hanging out at McDonald's and at Burger King, and I'm wearing a mask that makes me look different. Mm-hmm. But then they see the guy with the same mask at the McDonald's and the Burger King. You're saying that eventually they're just going to follow the guy with the mask back to his house. Is that kind of the idea? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, that's that's basically it. That that it's there's a lot of ability to kind of correlate um, different events at different times at different places with each other. Right. Even right. And, if, and and the problem seems like it's like oh well who would do that or we don't have enough processing power for that. But at a certain point, certain state actors probably have more than enough of both. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, uh, as much computer power as you can buy. Sure, we've got that. We've got stuff you don't even know about. <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyway, I think Tor is really interesting. I'm just not a regular Tor user. Right. Yeah. But uh, you know, getting back to uh, Vegas, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, not just at Bla- uh, DefCon, but also at Black Hat and B sides. Mm-hmm. Um, in particular, a whole bunch of interesting hardware related things are being presented at black hat this year okay Uh, so i would recommend that people check that out 
um, not just that talk from Colin, um, but there are some interesting talks on things like, um, here's one on breaking radiation monitoring devices. Uh, here's one on... As you um, do, right? Of course. Why wouldn't yeah. you? Here's you know one what I need? I need more uh, gamma rays. Yeah, more totally. Alpha particles, whatever. <laughs> uh, there's a really interesting looking one on uh, from some Chinese researchers on attacking uh, MEMS sensors with ultrasound. Uh, oh. and so like, like, you like can... vibrating the accelerometer out of a shell or something like that? Uh, well, it's like... Um, I, I, I I haven't read anything from them yet, but I would guess that they're doing things like um, by introducing uh, an ultrasonic frequency, uh, you can cause the MEMS sensor to detect something at a much lower frequency, to oh, erroneous, so it's, erroneously oh, it's like detect a, um, something at a lower frequency, right? It's like and, a... Not a sampling problem. What's it called? Uh, uh, aliasing. Aliasing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, oh, cool. A, aliasing may be one of the approaches that they're using. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but it's it's certainly uh, you know something that they probably considered at least. Um, so I'm really in, interested in in that one. And there are a whole bunch of things. There's there's one f- um, uh, from Marina Crotofil. I don't know if I pronounce her last name correctly, but she's a really cool uh, hardware hacker, and she is doing something on um, uh, kind of maybe vaguely related to that in, in that ultrasound thing uh, that has something to do with sensors in fluid and how she's able to introduce bubbles via cavitation uh, that mess with the sensors. Uh, so there are all, <laughs> all kinds of weird uh, esoteric uh, yeah. hardware things that are not necessarily just your traditional um traditional hardware hacking where you're like interfacing with a piece of electronics but uh-huh. but things where you may be taking you know exploiting some kind of physical process uh to interfere with or affect the behavior of some kind of system right yeah if you can't interrupt the bitstream of the sensor just change what's the sensor sensing right exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah that's cool yeah there was a really cool a uh, couple of talks i think marina actually contributed uh, to this research um, uh, by a Russian researcher um, that I met a couple of times last year, um, and uh, he um, he did he did some really interesting work on uh, the just focusing on uh, analog to digital converters uh-huh. in sensors, and um, and like there are a lot of people who have done work on how to spoof different types of sensors but uh but this this researcher alexander bolshev uh had done he he sort of reduced sensors down to their most important element which is usually an analog to digital converter and just like focused on that like what ways are there fundamentally to fool analog to digital converters and you know, he like, some... not not all sensors are digital output i'm just saying I, well I have, that's true I, you're, my analog you're right. internals are, are screaming right now uh-huh. yeah okay <laughs> you're, you're right right but yes but, uh, I, I understand what you mean like you're saying that if you if you attack that part of a digital sensor it's it's good the interesting thing is if you figure out how to defeat an analog to digital converter then you figured out how to defeat a huge range of sensors that use analog to digital converters not just one type of sensor Hmm. So is it, like, yeah, I guess, but it wouldn't actually be like an on-hardware attack, you're saying, right? It would be like messing with the ADC externally? Right. And so like the, the um, aliasing sort of attack that I mentioned earlier with the ultrasound, mm. that that's yeah. something that can affect uh, a wide variety of systems. And so... Right, uh, and you could probably do that outside, outside the package, right? You vibrate the whole package at some frequency and that messes with the internal uh, silicon and stuff. Exactly. Huh. Um, well, it may not it may not necessarily uh, have any physical effect on the silicon, but like if they haven't done their uh, if they haven't sanitized their input pop properly, as we say in the security world, um, and in this case that means by using good an, uh, anti aliasing filter, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, then you might be able to like vibrate a piece of equipment. I mean, just off the top of my head, let's say a centrifuge, um, <laughs> at, at, at a very high rate uh-huh. that would not be detected by a sensor that 
is expecting to detect vibrations at a lower rate. Right. Yeah. Or or you may be able to vibrate it at a high rate that makes it appear to be a vibration at a lower rate if that's what right. you want to achieve. Right. Yeah, it's like you want it to shut down so you Right. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Very interesting. Hmm. I suppose you need to still get to the to the physical thing though, which is sometimes sometimes a problem, sometimes not. So, yeah. 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 Well, cool. Well, it sounds like uh, quite quite the uh, quite the lineup coming up for for all these things, and it's good. I mean, it's good that there's there's it, there's more interest in general. I'm sure you're you're seeing lots of sales on the 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 hardware side of things. People wanting to access hardware and RF and stuff like that, right? So these are all good things for the hardware community. It seems like. I think so. There's definitely a a, a growing growing interest in hardware from the security side and. Uh, maybe a growing interest in security from the hardware side. I'm not so sure about that. I have thought about it more than I had in the past. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I talk to 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 y'all y'all more often than than most, maybe. But that doesn't mean that people listening aren't also thinking about it now. Uh, we'd love to hear from people if they are if they are thinking about it more than they used to. Um, I think it's probably really interesting. Is like the time when you really start to see that kind of change happening it's like if an executive's like well are we thinking about xyz that could happen you know if there's actual like people thinking about it as the product's being designed that's probably the biggest indication that it's it's important to companies and they understand the the con usually it's only done when there's understanding of the consequences of not doing it right so yeah well and that and we've seen that uh, across various industries that you know, of course, first from the software industry, because this happened like more than a decade ago. But um, you, you'll see an industry that kind of goes through the learning curve of, oh, our, our stuff is broken and we maybe should fix it. And how can we improve our security practices? And, and there's this whole learning curve. Um, and we're seeing that now in all kinds of industrial settings. Um, in, in particular, I know a, a lot of people who are focused on information security in the automotive industry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ten years because ago, of you recent stuff, right? Oh, yeah, you, you, <laughs> they did not have those people ten years ago. Um, right. But now they do. Uh, right. Also, the medical device industry, uh -huh. uh, yep. the uh, the industrial control system industry, like all of these groups have security problems and they're also working on security solutions and there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of opportunities i think uh, to kind of get into that those those industrial kinds of uh, hardware security yeah. kinds of spaces these days right well it, it almost seems like it's I mean, it doesn't need to be a mature industry but it does seem like that's once the industry and the stuff in that industry are prevalent enough then they become attack vectors for for bad actors right and then it's like okay, now it's worth, I mean, it's always worth thinking about it beforehand, but like there's actual consequences to not thinking about it at a certain point. So yeah, it's, that's why it seems like it, it, it usually goes to more mature industries because the hard part is getting the, the thing out there in the first place and then people start to break it. Yeah. 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 Ooh, I just thought of something. Total okay. change of subject. Sure. Did you see the article about Hacker F1 in the Daily Mail? I did not. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What was it? It was this this total hit job on <laughs> In the Daily Mail? No. <laughs> no way. I know. It it's pretty it was pretty hilarious. Uh and uh so they did this article, what was it a couple months ago, I think? Uh a hacking gadget that is a car thief's dream. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh I think the best thing about it was the photographs that they took yeah uh they took these amazing pictures of like the hacker in the hoodie breaking into cars oh my god i just saw it yep yeah isn't that phenomenal it's so bad <laughs> it's it's horrific i mean it's just the worst it's, thing ever it's <laughs> but it's hilarious uh yeah wow yeah also like, particularly... they, they have him wearing a hoodie holding a laptop with the hack rf on top of it yes like and then opening the car door, like, oh, now I can get in. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the brick also works. The brick also works. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we uh, we have discussed that at great length. Like, the easiest way to break into a car into HackRF is to put your HackRF in a nice 
a sturdy aluminum enclosure and throw <laughs> and it at the slam window. It. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. In 2015, more than 6,000 cars and vans were seized across the capital by gangs using key fobs that bypass vehicle security systems. Which has nothing to do with HackRF. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because HackRF is not a key fob. That's right. But, wow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well... I guess I guess you you take the good with the bad, huh, Mike? I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was kind of concerned about this article at first, but yeah, no, and just... then you're like, and then everybody reads it, and they're like, I want one. <laughs> 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 this is a great way to get potential, uh, uh, you know, thieves into the community, uh, and and you know, just interested passersby as well. Well, I figure like uh, the people who have seen this article. Like or the, pretty much anyone who looks at the Daily Mail and has half a brain realizes what the Daily Mail is. Uh, and well, you can wipe your ass with it, right? <laughs> our, right. Yeah. Our our market consists of people with at least half a brain, so I'm okay with that. Right. Right. Yeah. Andrew Miller, chief technical officier of the Motor Insurer Center, Thatch- Thatcham Research. Real, real brainiacs here, I'm sure. Most of these technologies are designed for only one purpose, which is to break into a car. Mike, I don't know if you know this, but all the, the hours and hours of software and flexibility you've designed into this thing, uh, right? They're just, they're just the show. They're all for show. It's actually, it's just, it's just for cars. That's what it's been the whole time. Turns out that was my motivation all That's along. Right, I, right. I just learned this by right. reading the words of some expert. Mike, at at every 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 evening. Osman goes out and he breaks into cars throughout the the greater Denver area. So, number one suspect. <laughs> it's always it's always Subarus. <laughs> it's, always, <laughs> it's always Subarus and cars that smell really skunky for some reason. Who knows? <laughs> That's the only kind of cars that are in Denver. So, <laughs> oh, I don't know about the skunky thing, but uh, well, we do have skunks. That I was talking about weed. I was talking about weed, Mike. Oh, that kind of skunk. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. I that's the thing. I I live up in the mountains. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm isolated from as criminals do. Herb. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I smell more actual skunks than, than skunky than, weed. Than skunky weed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rob, yeah. you buy you buy the best. I'm sure. That's yes. just my perspective. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> this is a fantastic <laughs> article, though. This is this is really fun. Uh, when you're for sale on Amazon, how's that going? <laughs> uh, I don't know. One of one or more of my resellers sells things on Amazon. Oh, it's a, oh, okay. I don't it's have anything you. to do with that directly. But, yeah. No. <laughs> any other new uh, any other new products in the pipeline, or is it the the hardware's? Oh, actually, we brought up Daisho uh, when when Fitz was on the show. How's how's Daisho going these days? It's not really. Um, okay. I mean, it's sitting on the shelf waiting for somebody to work on it some more. But um, more interns, man. More interns. Yeah, maybe. Uh, it's one of those things where it, it's just a. It's just been a lower priority, and we haven't had yeah. time to work on it because we have so many higher priorities. Uh, but there's still some cool aspects to that project that I think um, are are worth not forgetting about. Yeah. Um, the, the most significant of which is that we have an open source USB three device core uh, that people can use on FPGAs and right. Daisho is kind of the main platform that someone could use to experiment with that. Uh, on a related note, there's an interesting project to, um, it, it, this device core has been ported from our Altera platform to uh, Xilinx platform mm-hmm. recently. Um, and this, let's see if I can find it. It's, um, it's this, uh, project um, from a group that is, that has been uh, Tim Videos uh, is the guy. Tim his his handle is Mithro, and he is kind of leading this project to uh, create a kind of an HDMI <gasps> slinging. Oh, platform. I've seen this thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a video switcher for HDMI, right? It's uh, yeah, and yeah. No, like, I did see this. He got into this, I think, primarily because he's been part of the team to do, um, to do conference recordings, like yep, video, exactly. live video recording and streaming from yep. like CCC events in yep. Germany. And this is uh, why I got interested in it because I've been looking at doing like a portable video recording rig. And uh, I was looking for like what's out there for specifically for Linux, 
because yeah. like there's like capture cards, right? Capture cards for Linux are there are some, but they're not quite as prevalent. And um, so I want to use like OBS and and Linux and stuff like that uh, to capture HDMI. And I think this was this was one of the the top ones that popped up, but it's right. it's not it's still kind of in development. Yeah, the um, Numato Opsis uh, is actually Opsis. on Crowd Supply. Oh, um, and uh, yeah, so we should link into that. It, it's a really cool. Uh, platform. It's based on a Xilinx FPGA, and it has mm-hmm. like a bunch of different HDMI ins and outs that you can do really flexible things with. Yeah, right. And yeah, you can, like pass through. You can do. Uh, you can send it off to a recorder. You can like inject in the stream. I think something like that. Right. 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 Yeah. And this is this is something that was developed like just to support their conference video recording infrastructure at uh, at hacker events. Which is super cool, yeah. uh, and anyway, this thing is uh, kind of uh, it. It had a life of its own before Die Show, but it, it kind of par- portions of it have kind of um, forked off of Die Show, which is really cool. That even though Die Show itself hasn't turned into a commercial product, that that we've been able to provide something that has helped other another product become yeah. a reality. Just really, which is exactly what I want to see as an open source developer. Right, 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 right. And also they have Tim's Open FPGA expansion, which is then they link in that uh, that XKCD comic about the fourteen, see fourteen competing standards, and you make a fifteenth. Oh, nice! <laughs> one of yeah. my favorite, one of my favorite XKCDs. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah, well, yeah. So cool. that's a really cool uh, platform. I definitely recommend people check that out. Uh, but we've been working a lot on uh, on great fet stuff. Um, in particular, working on some neighbors for Great Fat. Um, I've got. I'm, I'm working right now on a a neighbor, which is an add-on board that is a super flexible uh, level shifting and multiplexing board. Oh, cool! Um, and so it allows you to like wire up to a bunch of test points on a target or something like that, and then then you can do some fairly sophisticated automated probing to figure out what kind of interface you have there or multiplex to a different peripheral on the great fats microcontroller and stuff like that That's and nice. and just do uh level shifting to whatever target voltage you have so it's like hook it up once instead of like having jumper wires all over the place you just hook yeah exactly. as many wires as you can then you say you define which wires which right and if yeah. you're using if you're using the great fat even for something simple like you just want to dump some flash memory or something like that uh you may be trying to interface with something that has a, a different voltage than your GreatFet. Yeah. And that's all. that's been a challenge for a long time for things like GoodFet and Bus Pirate. Oh, yeah. Um, that, like, the simpler, lower-cost platforms to do that tend to not have any kind of level shifting built right. in. And, and do you so, need to do that? Would you ever dump, like, a DDR? Is that why as well? So you can get, like, the, the various half-voltage stuff? Or is, or is that not why? Uh, maybe down the road. Um, but, uh, and, and that's something that... I'm looking at a little bit uh, right now. I'm looking at uh, thanks to a tip from David Karn. I'm looking at using the Green Pack chips. Oh, those uh, are cool little uh, chips. Yeah. yeah, as my level shifting solution. Yeah, uh, because there are these. They're they like ain't a tiny, cheap though. They ain't cheap. <laughs> I beg to differ. Really? Maybe yeah. you're buying in volume enough. I th- wait. Like how- okay. you can get if you just buy their dev kit that comes with like uh, uh i forget like a hundred chips or something like that uh-huh. um or tens of chips or something like that uh that you can program uh the, the they're at something like 60 cents a piece but is that you need one pack per chip or per line rather or, or what no and then i could do i could do level shifting on like eight lines on one oh, chip. oh okay i thought it was one per per line okay. no sorry so um, and that's, you know, that's the hundred or less quantity pricing. So, right, right. um, I don't know what they're right. So yeah, that'd be two and a half bucks for what for, for, for a 32 bit network bus. Yeah, rather, exactly. So, yeah. Right. So it's less pretty, than two bucks, probably a quantity, right? Right. Which I think okay, is that's pretty bad. reasonable. I was and, thinking per, per line. That's why. And that would get up there pretty fast. Right. Right. It right, would 30, 30 at 60 cents each would be what? Like 18 bucks. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, but I, I can get one that has like eight in and eight out, okay. um, 
for around that 60 cents or something like that at the that's cool at the you know fairly low volume price the and one of the interesting things about the green pack parts is that they they never had a uh, an HDL synthesis tool they only had schematic entry but they published their um, they published their bitstream format it's fully oh. documented and so Andrew Zonenberg has been working on an open source tool chain for it and so you can do using Andrew's tool you can use uh, this open source HDL synthesis tool chain, uh-huh. which is super cool. Yeah, uh, and it enables. So if you had en- if you had enough of these green packs on board, right, you could make a very 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 large <laughs> FPGA board. <laughs> uh, yeah, a- <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't. I mean, the the amount of logic per green pack chip is very small, but right, right. <laughs> um, but one of the nice things about them is that they they do. Um, some analog stuff in addition yeah, yeah. in addition to digital stuff so there's an like you can get a part that has an adc in there that you can switch into any yeah. p- any pin uh you can get parts that have multiple dacs that you can switch into any pin mm-hmm. you and the no the one pins... of my friends in town here is doing that actually so oh he really doing the analog stuff yeah yeah nice yeah he, he was the one who told me about these chips i i had i hadn't heard of them before that so they're 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 pretty fancy i gotta say chip of the week chip of the week <laughs> King of the North. <laughs> sorry, I haven't watched a lot of HBO lately. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been really excited about what's it called coming back. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, chip of the week. Cool. Yeah, uh, green pack. They, they have more than they just have the one, or is that? Well, it's a whole series of parts. Yeah. Um, and, and it's Salego. Salego is the company. Yeah. Yeah. Green pack is the the series of chips, yeah. and um, there's a whole bunch of them that have. It, oh, they're yeah. all kind of variations on a theme. Uh, they have like different amounts of pins or different types of logic inside them. Or like some of them are dual supply and others are single supply. I'm of yeah. course looking at the dual supply ones because I want to use it for level shifting. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it, I got a little concerned when I was looking through the documentation for them because it's all talking about one-time programming. Yeah. And, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, <laughs> that is not what I want. Right. Um, but there's this. Um, there's this method that they use, like, it's hard to find in their documentation because it's not like, it's not what they consider to be their primary use case. It, they're considered right. their primary they're, they're, use they're case. They're talking about production, right? Where it's like, exactly. you, you want to have a flexible, you know, tiny logic unit that can switch around as needed, right? Well, but they, they, they assume that their customers are doing a one-time programming to configure it uh, for a given design. Right. And... Uh, but they have a development method where you can basically load in a bitstream uh, into RAM instead of into their one-time memory and just configure the thing on the fly. Uh, it means you have to load a bitstream every time you power it up, but it's super flexible and you can do that indefinitely uh, instead of just one time. And mm. they they only document that as being like their, their development and test workflow. Um, not as a, like your final production workflow, but for got it, got but it, for yeah. my application, I would totally use that on an ongoing basis and never, uh, you know, never burn the one-time memory. Right. This this neighbor is always in development. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and where and so that's in one of their manuals. Uh, yeah. Like if you if you go through the data sheets for the parts. Okay. Um. You you'll you find look, look for the development section Ah, i can't remember what they call it uh they call it like oh i think they might call it emulation like (laughs) emulation yeah right that's a poor name chip emulation which uh it it doesn't really fully describe uh on chip emulation (laughs) what they're doing in my opinion they call it on chip emulation but really what it is is you're you're fully should, configuring the device. Say they should they should call it shit. Don't work yet, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, 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 um, that's nice. Actually, they they don't force you to give an email, but they do prompt you for one. I was just trying to get a uh, data sheet. So, yeah, another neighbor we've been working on is uh, this infrared hacking neighbor. That's a lot of fun. Uh, that lets you, it, it basically allows you to do a software defined radio approach to infrared transmit and receive. Nice. 
And uh, so we're, do- we're like sampling an incoming infrared signal at 20 million samples per second and <laughs> things, things right. like that. Right, for like a 32 kilohertz signal or whatever it is. Well, the thing is, it turns out there are a lot more interesting things in the world of infrared than just like oh, typical sure, right, 38 right. kilohertz like, remote controls. Yeah. But most of the off-the-shelf chips that you're going to get are going to be like pre-programmed at the 38 kilohertz, whatever, right? So Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you could do things with our platform like... Uh, fingerprint the difference between multiple 38 kilohertz devices that are all in the same room. Good Lord. Uh, <laughs> and, and also we found some interesting target devices like um, that are not 38 kilohertz infrared, but things like uh, audio over infrared, um, both analog audio over digital infrared and digital audio over infrared. Oh my God. I used to have a headset that did that. That was my first yep. pair of wireless headphones. Yeah. And I remember if you laid down on one side, even though it was a headphone, so it didn't feel good, it would like, <laughs> it would just go staticky because you'd be blocking yeah. the signal. And you know where those oh are super God. popular now is in automobiles for the, the seat back, uh, entertainment systems. Really? Yeah. They use almost <gasps> all of those things. Use oh my God. Infrared headphones. Oh my God. Does that mean that you could eventually, you could pipe, no, it wouldn't go through a window though. That's the problem. So if someone had an open window though, and you and you flooded the signal in oh, there, oh yeah, absolutely. I've always wanted that. Yeah. Like that's what I've always wanted is, is like a car device so that I could basically like if I knew what frequency their their radio was tuned to, right? If they were like right. ninety eight point five, just like right. to hop on that and just be like, stop driving like an a hole, a hole. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Just to see their face. Hopefully they wouldn't go off the road, but you know, just like pirate pirate uh, inject. Uh, my insult to them. I, I just want them to hear my insult as they're driving poorly. Uh, right. Yeah. That, that <laughs> I, is totally a thing. I have very simple thing. needs here, you know? <laughs> I, That's cool, though. Yeah. And creepy. Uh, people have done that with Bluetooth, Bluetooth too, actually. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, kind they of just... in the early days of Bluetooth hacking, there were a lot of vulnerabilities in, um, like, you could just connect to somebody's uh, like in the, the very early days of, of like car kits, Bluetooth car mm-hmm. kits. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, like yeah, it's had, like your iPod would hook into the RF, it would be they, like a Bluetooth to FM transmitter or something. They had like no security on the, um, uh, like car kits for, for mobile phones. Yeah, uh, yeah. They had no security on like being able to pretend you're a phone and talk to the car <laughs> and uh or car, talk to the car kit which is often an aftermarket thing and then got it yeah uh, right. and then you could just talk to people while they're driving yeah those were the days those were the days <laughs> when hacks were plentiful and cheap <laughs> but now they need other kits so they can they can buy them from from you and buy a hack rf or a great fed or whatever and, and move move on with their hacking uh well anything else we should know before we go because we should probably Wrap. Yeah, we probably should wrap We're up. We're like an hour and 45 minutes almost, so. Oh, good. pushing it. Yeah. You know, you know how it is. Well, it's when been Michael fun, Osmond man. is on the amp hour, it's 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 like uh, it's like old times, you know. It's what, their fifth fifth appearance? Something like that. It's, Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a good run. <laughs> is this the last one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no idea. <laughs> and we, tonight we say farewell That's to Michael one. Osmond. It's up to you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, I'll see you at, at uh, DEF CON and hopefully at future conferences after that. And, yeah, uh, definitely at the uh, at the SuperCon. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, of course, the Open Hardware Summit's coming up, too. Oh, also, yeah, in your neighborhood. So That's right. Maybe, it's going yeah. to be in Colorado this year, which I'm excited about. Right, and they just published a schedule, too. I, uh, I posted that on the subreddit. So Excellent. People can check out the Open Hardware Summit schedule. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, thanks again, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right, catch you next time.